Russian military to launch drills that could defeat NATO forces in less than two days. This is an article by Tom O'Connor on Newsweek, and you can read about it on Yahoo.com or you can go to Newsweek. Here's what I find interesting is if you see right here the battalions and the amount of troops that NATO forces have versus Russia and their military combined with Belarus, the numbers are very lopsided. And then I start to think to myself, does it even matter anymore with 21st century warfare? Because with space weapons, rod of God, nuclear weapons, biological weapons, nanotechnologies, frequency warfare, satellites, the more troops you have in one location, wouldn't that be somewhat of a target now in today's day and age? So, I mean, if you put all your eggs in one basket or a whole bunch of them, then you're a sitting duck. Now, before when you didn't have reconnaissance where there were satellites in space and the eye in the sky and literally technologies that can pick up on where somebody is with wi- Wi-Fi signals, essentially, and lasers that can literally tap on your... Okay, let's say you're having a conversation with somebody in your house and the powers that be go out and pick up technologies. I don't know what the exact name is, but it's a gun essentially that shoots a laser at your window. And that laser picks up all the frequencies inside of the house. Those frequencies will then relay what you're saying. And this is old school technology. I'm sure you guys have seen this stuff even in the movies. So where do you think they got the idea? Nanny, nanny, nanny. So I'm seeing the saber rattling game being played here. Now, there's a huge, huge exercise that Russia's playing here shortly. It's called the Zapod. And this is Zapod 99. And what Zapod stands for is West. So essentially, it's Russia and Belarus getting together and putting together war games, essentially, on how quick they could get to the target of NATO, you know, the NATO target, their adversary here. Then you go up to 2017. This is a great article from nationalinterest.org. Let me read this to you real quick. In early 2008, when Russian troops invaded Georgian territory, it came as a surprise to the global community, which had been following the Olympic Games in Beijing and enjoying the summer holiday season. Troops of Russia's 58th Army began their military operation just after finishing the Kavkaz 2008 military exercise which coincidentally was conducted north of Georgia from July 15th through the 31st. Now let's fast forward five years. In 2013, Russia reintroduced a training concept into its military exercises known as the SNAP exercise or no-notice exercise. These types of exercises often involve a large number of troops. After four such SNAP letters, troops were put into motion in 2013. Another such exercise was conducted between February 26th and March 3rd, of 2014. That event engaged large numbers of airborne troops, transportation aircraft, and long-range aircraft. Officially, the exercise involved 1,200 amphibious compact combat vehicles, 880 battle tanks, 120 attack helicopters. At that time, a significant number of troops were deployed into, I don't know how to pronounce that, and its vicinity under the disguise of its exercise. Crimea? Is that how it's pronounced? The next step was the effective capture of Crimea or Crimea with troops which officially took part in a regular military exercise. Three years later, in September 2017, another large-scale Russian exercise is planned. Unlike the SNAP exercises, Zapod West takes place every four years and is scheduled as well as notified well in advance. It encompasses several preparation episodes and smaller exercises, some of them usually with a no-notice character, which lead to the culmination of these Russian-led multinational maneuvers. This year's exercise, again, to take place both in Belarus and in western Russia, including the Kaliningrad Oblast, might be one of the largest exercises since 1991. And then it goes on to say, with the amount of train cars, over 4,000 transporting troops, they could essentially add another 30,000 or so people out there in a very short amount of time. So is Russia getting ready to take over another piece of real estate, ladies and gentlemen? What's your take? And is NATO going to 
kind of just let it happen? Or is this going to be another push, another spark for what some psychopaths want at very high levels that profit off of war? Are we going to war? And all the wag the dog, oh, let's worry about little Kim Jong-un. Let's worry about little Kim. He's got 70 submarines from World War II, man. You can't find those things. I'm telling you. I'd be a lot more concerned about Russia, especially when you've got articles coming out saying that they could wipe out troops, the NATO troops in that area, within 48 hours. Less than two days. I think it was like 36 hours or something like that. Now, with that said, once again, with all the different technologies and weapons that are available today, that many troops in one location, is that a good thing or a bad thing in the 21st century of war? Now, obviously, once you've got certain positions, once you've created certain chaos and enough destruction via other technologies, then yeah, I mean, it, it absolutely having a lot of troops. And if you just want to go in and, and with brute force without using those technologies or go in in a way to where like the big bully, essentially, where look, we're all here. What are you going to do about it? You know, it's a little late now, right? They're going to be like, oh, okay. Yeah, you're right. You can, you can take our country. You can take our land, but you can't take our freedom. <laughs> William Wallace, man, that guy's my hero. The Scottish are awesome. I've got ancestors from Scotland. So these guys are badass. I'm divagating. Let's get back to the discussion at hand here. Now, this is a list of the NATO countries in Europe that are in blue. You can uh, see right here. And then you've got the Russian Federation. So Belarus and Russia right there, if they were to go in, you think they're going to they're going to pick up some real estate in Lithuania first. What's their plan? What's their goal this year? There's not a whole lot of information out about this 2017 exercise, except for it's huge. It's going to be the biggest since 91. So that's 30, what, 30 years? Almost 27 years. 26 years. That's a long time especially with all the emergency meetings and stuff that are going on right now. So I'm not saying we're going to war. I'm just saying let's definitely keep our eyes and ears open. So if there's information that we can get access to in case we are going to war, we can get prepared for it as best as possible and support our friends and family. Now, this right here is another map. This is from the globalstate.com. And you can see the North, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, the Collective Security Treaty Organization, where you've got the offsetting factions here. And if it does get into a global scale war, well, then people are going to start picking sides, kind of like that anonymous video came out. Countries are going to start picking sides. They're maybe on the fence. Maybe some countries will, will jump, jump ship. Maybe Trump, Donald Trump, President Donald Trump, maybe he'll do such a good job selling these other countries into joining forces with NATO that he'll be like the entrepreneur or uh, what was that TV show that he was in called where he'd always tell people, you're fired, you're fired. Here's some member states of NATO right here if you want to read about this article on Wikipedia. But here's another thing, too, that I want to let you guys know about. I am extremely excited about this. Hope to see it X-Fest here. This is coming up really soon. Matter of fact, May 19th through the 21st, make sure to RSVP. If you want to check out these bunkers that are out there, they're over 2,000 square feet. I'm going to show you some right here, some images. You can scroll through this. Matter of fact, here, let's turn off the Google Maps. Let's do this. I'm going to turn off the Google Maps here. All right. And then we'll move this over here. Make it a larger screen. I'll just turn my video off. Okay. So you can see right here, essentially, if you buy one of these bunkers, and here's the cool thing, they're 25 grand. Is that a lot of money? Yes, that's a lot of money. Is that a lot of money for what you're getting? Well, you tell me. A 2,000 square foot bunker made out of concrete and still reinforced with approximately 400 feet on each side of you as far as space until you bump into another bunker? Is that a bad deal? Now, convert it into a beautiful vacation home out in South Dakota. So when you want to go to Sturgis and the for the bike rallies, or if you want to go to the, the Badlands, or the Black Hills, or Mount Rushmore, or Keystone, or, or Deadwood, or Crazy Horse, or 
Devil's Tower or somewhere really neat out there by Lead or Lead. Some people call it Lead, which is about 6,000 plus feet in elevation out in the Black Hills. So all of this stuff is in a pretty close proximity, folks. And also, this is where you can see what it kind of looks like scattered, scattered about. Here is the, the map, essentially, of 575 off-grid bunkers. Imagine this being like a micro-community that is beyond awesome. You know, brilliant minds all around the world putting some money into one of these bunkers and turning it into a vacation home or a studio or a location to just get away, get off the grid for a while and come up with amazing inventions, or maybe you're an author, or maybe you're a sculptor, or maybe you're a artist, maybe you're an entertainer, maybe you're an engineer, maybe you work at a convenience store. Heck, I don't care. What, what do you like to do? What are you into? Are you looking for an opportunity to get in on a phase one opportunity, ground floor, essentially? And these things are going to go up in price. So like right now, they're 25 grand, and they're definitely going to go up. They're doing three-year financing with no interest. You can go in on it with your friends and family if you want to. These things can house 10 people. If you need something that on you know as cheap as possible, you divide that 25 grand by 10 people, that's 2,500 bucks a pop. And it's just in such a cool area. So you can see right here, these were built by the military in I think the 40s approximately, and they were built to withstand munitions. So they house military explosives. And you can lay out the floor plan in all sorts of different ways. There's going to be water and all the other stuff is up to you. So uh, it's an open shell. It's, it's, a, it's like the Wild West, but cooler because we've got technologies now to where you can put a shower in there. You know, you can put a toilet in there. You can put a heater in there and you can set up energy to where you don't have to rely on these giant conglomerates that just suck people dry with utilities and plus you're helping out the environment and you're being the change you want to see if that's what you're into so check it out folks x fest you can also if you want to you can set up a rsvp where you can actually stay in one of the bunkers for free for the x fest let me see if i can make this a little bit bigger here there we go Okay, so that'll be you when you get in there, right? You'll be like, wow, this is totally bare. What do I do now? Well, you can do whatever you want to, <laughs> you know, within reason. I mean, check that out. So you can set it up. If you're a, a contractor, if you know a contractor, I know people that spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on motorhomes and RVs and fifth wheels. Well, wouldn't it be neat to have a piece of security in a very safe location off the grid but also close enough to where if you wanted to go do something exciting, you're about half an hour away. You know, here's another image here. You can see how they're laid out. You can see you got the hills behind you there. Somebody said they thought it looked like this fence was pointing inwards. It's not pointing inwards, folks. It's not designed to keep you in. That's just the angle of the <laughs> that's just the angle of the the camera right there. So isn't it cool that it is fenced off? I think that's great. I think that's really good news. And check out the top here. So here's what I want to do with mine, because I have one. And I want to set it up to where I'm going to set, like, maybe some crops on the top there, right? And then I'm going to set up what's called a solar pond or a sun pool eventually, which you can harness energy from a, a hole that you dig into the ground, size of a swimming pool, fill it up with water and some chemicals, and there's this specific turbine that you use as well in conjunction and that's the basic blueprint. Well, that way you can produce power, energy, and you don't need a windmill or a solar panel. I'm going to have all three. So I've already got solar panels and the windmill, that's going to be next. And I've got a lot of modular stuff, so I can just take it out there and set it up where I don't have to go out and start building a bunch of things because I'm already essentially set up for living off the grid and I put, you know, a few grand, not a whole bunch of money, but it's not going to be nice like that picture you just saw. That would cost about $150,000 to do something like that. So here's some more pictures. Now, RSVP, use the code Leak Project. You can go to terravivos.com or you can go to guestbookingsleakproject.com. If you use the code Leak Project and you purchase one of these bunkers, well, there's going to be some extra goods that are going to be offered for you. 
And that could be either like a Berkey water filter. You could pick up a small, we've got these small solar generator dills, one of those, or you could get a windmill set up. Now, once again, here's how I'm looking at this. I don't want an SHTF scenario to happen at all. Yeah. I like being able to go to the store. I like being able to go watch a movie. I went out and watched Guardians of the Galaxy 2 the other night. It was an amazing movie. You know, imagine being in glo global thermal nuclear war. We're not going to be able to go see movies. We're not going to be able to go on a nice bike ride or go jump in the car and go pick up a latte or something as easy. It's going to be a lot more difficult if there's thermal nuclear war going on. So if it does happen, I certainly don't want to be in the city. If martial law goes down, I certainly don't want to be in the city. If a bank holiday happens, I certainly don't want to be in the city. If the government collapses, I certainly don't want to be in the city. If we get attacked by other countries, if an EMP happens, if there's a solar flare that wipes out the satellites, if there is a pandemic, if there is a real flu pandemic that people actually really get sick, not just get sick for a few days and then get over it, I don't want to be near anybody unless they're safe and they're like-minded. Or even if they're not like-minded, as long as they're cool people, because I don't know a whole lot of people that are like-minded like me, especially in real life, as far as when I go outside of my garage. Yes, there's many of you that think like me, and I think that's amazing, yet we kind of resonate together because you start doing research on certain topics, and you see that's what I'm doing research on as well, so we all kind of collectively gather here at League Project. You're definitely out there. I just don't meet a lot of you. So hopefully I'll see some of you guys at the X-Fest. I'm sure I will. I mean, we've already got several hundred people that are going to be there. So I'm excited. I'm bringing my telescope. We're going to look at the stars out there, have an opportunity to talk about some solutions and some things that we can do to make a change and make a difference as a whole to benefit society, to benefit the world, to benefit you, your family, your friends, your future generations. This is awesome, you guys. I mean, can you imagine owning a piece out there and then going out there in the summer times? Things are good. You've just got like a vacation home out there. It's beautiful in the Black Hills. One of my favorite places in the world. Matter of fact, my very favorite place that I have ever been to in my entire life is outside of the Badlands. It's not in the Badlands National Park, but it's in that area within about an hour or so. And it's off of some native land. And one of the best nights I've ever had in my life back in 2013, it was so majestic. It was, oh my goodness, I feel so good just thinking about it. It was out there in the Black Hills, about, about an hour away from where my bunker is. And I remember spent the night out there by myself. I was parked on the, here, I'll share it with you guys. I'll, I'll do my best to, to paint the picture for you as I'm talking to you. So at that time, I had a Subaru, a Subaru Baja. Had to be unique, you know, like a, a, a truck slash car because I like sports cars, but I also like the utility factor. And this thing was like driving around in a, in a torture chamber. The, the, the seat sucked. And the car that I got, everything that could go wrong with it did. I put twice the amount of money into the car than what I paid for it, and I sold it for a third of what I put into it altogether. It was a nightmare. I mean, it was just the car from hell. I still like Subarus, but that Subaru, the people that had it before me, must have just beat the daylights out of it because Subarus are usually really strong cars. So I'm out there, and I'm in this area that you have to have a high-clearance vehicle to get to, and nobody else out there but me. That's the way I like it. So I'm on the, the mountaintop, and out in the horizon, you could see the Badlands. Not the Badlands from the National Park, but an area that looks just like the Badlands. And there's this one area out there that looks like something out of Egypt. It looks like the Pharaoh carving or something, but, but standing you know, like upright and larger. These are much larger than those, but just as far away as I was, that was the mindset that I got. And as the sun set, the sun hit on that area out there that looked like the Pharaoh. And you could see the rays of the sun bounce off of it like this. And I, got, I have a picture of it awesome picture and wow just awesome thinking about it and there was these that night there were these bats hovering over me and there was some some mountain lion not mountain lions uh the like the the mountain goats the what am i thinking here the 
They got horns on them, rams essentially. And they can walk on, it was, it was really neat to watch them because they would just walk on to areas that you would be scared to and their balance would be incredible and they'd just sit down on either side of them was impending death with, you know, a little sliver like this and they'd just sit there all zen-like. It was really, really fun to watch them. I don't know why I'm having a harp on moment here and I can't remember what they're called, but they're, they're rams, the ram horns. Man, why am I having a tough time remembering this? I don't know. It's, it's been a long day already. It's early for me, folks. It's 1 p.m. and I've already, it's like my fourth podcast today. So I'm out there and just the whole night was mystical. And, you know, the next day I wake up, beautiful day, beautiful skies, no chemtrails. And it was just one of those nights that you never forget. Oh, yeah. And I went and wandered off that night just a little bit, you know, a few blocks away from the car and stuff and my campsite. And I could hear, so there's these, these bushes and inside of the bushes, I hear some rattling and I hear, I hear this like, <laughs> it, was, it was weird. And I wanted to go in and check it out, but something told me not to. Something was like, ah, maybe just go back to your car, Rex. So there was something in the bushes there. Maybe it was a mountain lion. Maybe it was Bigfoot. Heck, I don't know. Maybe it was just my imagination, but I definitely heard something and you could hear the, the, the branches and stuff like that crackling and stuff in that, in that area. And my gut was like, turn around, go back to your car now. So anyway, good times. So I hope to see you there. X-Fest. Be the change you want to see. Have a beautiful day. Russian military to launch drills that could defeat NATO forces in less than two days. This is an article by Tom O'Connor on Newsweek. And you can read about it on yahoo.com or you can go to Newsweek. Here's what I find interesting is if you see right here the battalions and the amount of troops that NATO forces have versus Russia and their military combined with Belarus, the numbers are very lopsided. And then I start to think to myself, does it even matter anymore with 21st century warfare? Because with space weapons, rod of God, nuclear weapons, biological weapons, nanotechnologies, frequency warfare, satellites. The more troops you have in one location, wouldn't that be somewhat of a target now in today's day and age? So, I mean, if you put all your eggs in one basket or a whole bunch of them, then you're a sitting duck. Now, before when you didn't have reconnaissance where there were satellites in space and the eye in the sky and literally technologies that can pick up on where somebody is with wi Wi-Fi signals, essentially, and lasers that can literally tap on your... Okay, let's say you're having a conversation with somebody in your house and the powers that be go out and pick and putting together war games, essentially, on how quick they could get to the target of NATO, you know, the NATO target, their adversary here, then you go up to 2017. This is a great article from nationalinterest.org. Let me read this to you real quick. In early 2008, when Russian troops invaded Georgian territory, it came as a surprise to the global community, which had been following the Olympic Games in Beijing and enjoying the summer holiday season. Troops of Russia's 58th Army began their military operation just after finishing the Kavkaz 2008 military exercise which coincidentally was conducted north of Georgia from July 15th through the 31st. Now let's fast forward five years. In 2013, Russia reintroduced a training concept into its military exercises known as the SNAP exercise or no-notice exercise. These types of exercises often involve a large number of troops. After four such SNAP letters, troops were put into motion in 2013. Another such exercise was conducted between February 26th and March 3rd, of 2014. That event engaged large numbers of airborne troops, transportation aircraft, and long-range aircraft. Officially, the exercise involved 1,200 amphibious compact combat vehicles, 800 up technologies. I don't know what the exact name is, but it's a gun, essentially, that shoots a laser at your window. And that laser picks up all the frequencies inside of the house. Those frequencies will then relay what you're saying. And this is old school technology. I'm sure you guys have seen this stuff even in the movies. So where do you think they got the idea? Nanny, nanny, nanny. So I'm seeing the saber rattling game being played here. Now, there's a huge, huge exercise that Russia's playing 
here shortly. It's called the Zapod. And this is Zapod 99, and what Zapod stands for is West. So essentially, it's Russia and Belarus getting together.